and you scare them with your guns and what have you. Still, you're a better bet than the current fat and bob they have, who goes around taking their bread from them, their grain from them, their money from them, taking their wives and daughters from them whenever he fancies them, with only a little bit of prompting and cajoling, a twinkling smile or two, which they understand, even if they don't understand what the smile is saying. They take that and the guns and the weapons and the drill and the tactics and the confidence you've given them. And they surround the fat Bob's palace in a ring of chanting, heaving, determined bodies, which won't shift. And if you try to sneak through, it gets sucked into a moor of flesh like being sucked into a whirlpool. So that the Bob's got no other choice but to give in and throw his hands and throw his crown at them, his queen. And when he looks round at who to give them to, so he isn't torn into pieces the size of stamps, with his fat head on them and the crowd and growling and shuffling and getting ready to start pitching sharp things at him. It's only when he looks at you with a crown in one hand, an imploring gesture being made by the other, and his eyes are watery and pleading and hopeful and hopeless and scared, and the crowd suddenly hush as they see where he's looking, and you suddenly feel your arm lifting, your hand reaching out, and you gently trace the band of the crown that's round to make sure it is real, and then you close the whole of your hand around it and you snatch it with a jerk. And you look at it in the same way you looked at her when she slowly undressed that night in your room. And then before anyone can do anything, take anything away, you put the crown on your head, pretending you're not being reverential, you are a bit. Pretending you're you know, trying to be that cocky, cool person that all the people down there have been inspired by and now should be slightly scared of. And then there's a moment of pure, utter silence. Like you get at 4 a.m. when everything is still or dead, and then you're almost blown back by this gust of noise, this rush of love and fear and hope and expectations and dreams, all in this one blast, this one expansion of emotion. 64. Yeah, that'd be cool. 64.1. Yeah, that'd be fucking cool. Right. Oh, thank you. If you're going to go, go, right? Um, some new-ish ones now. Um, somebody commissioned me to write a poem about Montaigne, of all things. I don't know why they thought that I would be able to take on the world's greatest secular thinker, but here we go. It's called Dauntless Style. And to tease us, the lesser God we have been saddled with, as our particularly omnipotent yet hand-wringingly incompetent deity, decided to delay the How to Argue module of the Being a Human course for 1,400 years or so, give or take, until the right tutor could be found a likely story. Did no seraphim want to don a mortarboard and boss us around? But there he is, weighing things up again, being ever so reasonable again, even-handed, balanced. Pulling thought down from the skies like it isn't holy, and then daring to tell us it's ours too. What dauntless style this mode of being! Now we can all assay, power, sachet our ribaldry, our sequiturs, our reasons, treasons, and decisions into patterns we sometimes agree upon and call it civilization. Ah, electric synapse jumping! Let's hope no one guesses you cause the pain behind the eyes too. Um, so, my next book is slowly coming into shape and yeah, the megalomania is the theme of I've decided to write many poems in the voice of Neptune because obviously I now want to be a god of the sea and not just a king. <laughs> <laughs> And this one fits into that. Um, feels opposite because it's set in a gallery as well. It's called Neptune's Concrete Crash Night. I rest my head for a moment on the cool concrete wall of the art gallery. And in its undulations, I can feel the past trying to break out of its unexpected vertical tomb. I could rub the back of my head into one of the grooves, wear it away, erode it imperceptibly over a day's eon, until I could place my head right back into the crevasse, a temporary sarcophagus, an extra heavy duty crash event. This, of course, might be an overreaction to the images I've just seen. 
a world melting, gangsters wearing dresses, and razored scars of silver stars, lakes of petrol waiting for paper boats to be sailed upon them. As if Neptune had said yes to a sponsorship deal from, insert oil company name here. But I only lately realised that the proposed replacement for a rapidly drying Aral Sea might not have been everything promised in the brochure. Caveat emptor, as we all should have said in 1764 when Harbury spun Jenny. But how could any of us know that cold plus steam would equal not just movement, but the end? I might stay in here. It keeps my head cool. Right. Um, this poem is an attempt to convince you that good things do happen at Ikea on a Friday night. It's called Shower on the Bus Driver. A shadow is watching. The shadow is watching. The couple in parkers at the bus stop oblivious to moving at one degree below. Exploring their passion for rumble strips together and apart. Dreaming of Beverly Hills renovations, balls of light disguised as seals. And Sharon, the bus driver, smiles, shakes his head. Because what is Friday night if not for the end of love and the beginning of love and every death in between? A mindful leap to better living, a better you, a better us. All the songs he's heard before, and still he can't help but sing them under the breath he doesn't have. And that's the lesson, isn't it? A kiss is as good as a breath, and inhale, 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 the wonder of it, this, you, us. Open outcry, almost, oh, almost, almost. In your scrapbook of transcendence, are there more than introductory kisses to your handfast love? The one who flutters back and back and back. Reborn in their absence, not as salvation, but rather your forever. If only you could tell your fear in open outcry. No, I am ready now. I will run to you. Don't fly away again. This problem is heaven. If a milksop can find courage as well as desire. I wish they would text me. In the company of the willing, we can weave magic. I shall pick it up now as we cascade towards the finish. Um, oh, where has it gone? Ah, here we go. Right, you are an artistic bunch, so you will know that the 18th century greatest portrait painter is Joshua Reynolds, and I am here to tell you that you are wrong, because the 18th century's greatest portrait painter is, of course, George <laughs> oh, George Bromley is so long since I've read this book, I've forgotten it. And I tell you that because Bromley pops up in this, in this poem, along with his most famous muse, Emma Hamilton. The poem is called Licking Stamps. Let me guess, Haynes boy, you'll depict me as your Emma Hamilton in that Bromley portrait, all cheesecloth and Cersei. Before moving on to some nonsense about how I'm an antebellum babe, and that you have a battle plan for courting to neuter my gatling gun tongue. And then you'll have me say something like, I want to be ravaged like Dresden in 1945, when clearly I want to be ravaged like Northumbria in 865. But still, really, the martial metaphor? I don't want things like fireworks or starlight either. The oil still is better, but then that's making sense with me topical when it should be newsworthy. I know, I've got it. How about fucking me is like licking stamps? Sticky, time consuming, and capable of taking you to destinations exotic and mundane. Yes, I like that very much. All right. And 
I shall take my leave with this and the imprecation, the plea that if you ever write about this project, please do not use the title of the poem as an adjective to describe said object, said phenomenon, because there are so many other things out there. The poem is called Gun Metal. The sky vibrates like Mussolini's mistress's dentures in a Waterford tumbler. The sky throbs precipitately pink like the ululating oestrogen of a tank bat fan. The sky is a precious, precious green, Edmund, a precious, precious green. The sky is as cold as an ersatz gazpacho made out of a homeopathic LD tomato. The sky is as playfully obtuse as an obscure collection of flaming lips b-sides. The sky is as rigorously gloomy as a Bank of England in economic prognostication. The sky is an edition of Noel's house party, full of gunge and the sound of a booming god laughing at our pratfalls. The sky is a flying change of leg in the dressage. The sky is a town in Google chat, endlessly referring to its own digital circularity. The sky is not the sky, it is the sea, having got terribly confused at Job Centre Plus. The sky is an engine powered by steam and onions and polystyrene chips. The sky is just fucking awesome, okay, and doesn't need a weapons-based simile to make it so. Thank you very much.